When we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable. That every human soul is in fact one The following is a one-page introduction I submitted for Eric J. Millar's recently released hardback omnibus, an outlet press collection of the last decade's worth of his illustrative narratives. And it goes as follows. You're a pawn. You're a fiddly digit tethered to a nervous system, subjugated, perhaps oppressed, your tune is not your whistle. Yet, in this shallow reading of archetypal playthings, your balance beams shiver hard and kick even worse. You are not a pawn. You are an etching on a paddle, scarred with marks. You are an indent. Your eyes start to squint. You're a rat named Harvey on a perpetual machine, black-eyed and somber. You see the coming end of the cosmos in your cornflakes, and as you ponder the dirt beneath your visage drips and drifts like spoils and spills of ink. You are a loony tune, bardo bouncing in between canyon falls enveloped in somatic onomatopoeia, each death a momentary comfort in a chapel of cacophony. A cat in a cock await your eternal return, rolling dice in an impossible game between each soul you burn. But your ghost is too busy performing sleight of hand in a vacuum for a fourth dimensional audience. You'll master this stage show. You have all the time in the world now. You've been here before. You'll be here again. Yet next time you'll bleed in an alien language unfathomable to this timeline. And each time you'll stay a little longer in the serial, voyant, bardo bouncing, never ending hamster wheel of metamorphosis. You are the creations of Eric J. Millar. And you are right to stay a little longer. Please pick up Eric's Omnibus. It transcends modern occultism in the most brilliant, anarchic, and purely individualistic creative gusto. Speaking of transcending the need for traditional form and functions, as we talk here today, subscribe to Eric's brilliant mundane magic grimoire of personal deities entitled No Gods But My Own, available on Substack. And if you haven't yet, Check out our new We The Hallowed Audio sigil that he is very abundant in. And all links will be available in the show notes in our Media Mancy Collective's website, We The Hallowed. Without further ado, slither here the weirdos and witches. Here's my conversation with Eric J. Alar. I saw that you talked to, and I've talked about this when, you know, releasing the audio sigil, that postpartum depression. Oh, yeah. Speaking of parenting, you know, parenting, (laughs) you know, big, wondrous works of art and uh, like really cherishing that process and then releasing it and then having it just be over. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And you've done that with the outlet uh, press omnibus. But the thing is, it's been it's got to be a bigger kind of uh exorcism for you because it's over 10 years of illustrative work oh yeah yeah and 
I will definitely say I've been dealing with some depression based on it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's basically like the capstone on the entire Outlet Press era. Like it's just the last Outlet Press release. Yeah. I'm one of the, the lucky people to have a lot of them, if not most of them, um, in single, you know, publications. And yeah. It was so cool to see how you designed, how your designing gumption really like came out in full swing with this thing. And I got to imagine it it probably was nerve wracking just going over the past 10 years, what to include, how to lay it out. Yeah. Can you talk about that process? Oh, yeah, it was it was uh, it was pretty difficult to kind of like whittle down which of the 21 books were going to get fully included and which ones <laughs> were going to get excerpted and stuff like that but it was uh like fit like translating the original design to a format where i would have sometimes six to ten pages of the original book on a single page right of the omnibus it was it was kind of a nightmare on some parts i had to kick a couple books out just because of that because i couldn't figure out how to get a design that worked without taking up 80 pages of book so was that like a kill your darlings kind of episode or definitely yeah. definitely but and uh, i just want to show it before we talk more about it this is the wonderful hardback 10 years of illustrative brilliance and other uh, musings from eric and hardback from lulu right yeah and it's just the design is just beautiful when i got this in the mail and opened it up i was just ecstatic it's absolutely gorgeous and it looks so good on a coffee table. Oh yeah, it, it it's almost <laughs> like a coffee table art book. Like it's, it's got glossy paper and everything. Yep. I know you've talked about it to me, and I think publicly somewhat. But kind of ending Outlet Press is this your swan song for it, or? Yeah, this is definitely going to be it for it. I was originally gonna. I was thinking about doing like a yearly Outlet Almanac, is what I was calling it. But I'm not sure if I'm gonna still do that. I might just still release books when they come, but just put yeah. my name on it. That we're talking about compounding all this postpartum depression of finishing this huge thing, right? What's the measurement of grief that you're going through for letting go of Outlet Press, which is something you've worked under for so long? Uh, it actually kind of feels good. Yeah. To kind of like get out from under like a uh, kind of an illusion of professionalism. Like, yeah, because you, yeah, Outlet Press, it makes it seem like a, a big publishing kind of enterprise yeah, which it was it's just you know there was one person it, behind yeah, it. it was just me <laughs> yeah. i mean i think i did maybe two books by other people over the entire 10 years mm -hmm. but yeah beyond me like that was it i did 21 or 22 books and then two extras in there somewhere but i, I mean, tried to make it look professional it, I mean, they all were. They're all great books. I'm a big fan, of course. I kind of felt it, too, because, you know, I've been working on something that's trying to kill a sort of persona or, mm -hmm. you know, a character or an identity that I've been working under for so long. And I, I feel it like every time the work tightens that it's it's the kind of this grieving process in doing it, you know? Oh, yeah. At the same time. Yeah. Because it was so easy to hide behind, in a way, right? Like a, a character or an, an ideology that's kind of, it doesn't have to be me all the time. Yeah. 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 But I think, you know, with your new work, with No Gods But My Own, I think it's just a monumental process to see. And please subscribe to the Substack. You're kind of moving forward with a, how do I put this? A more to the people output at, at a, con a more constant rate, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do a more regular, like, like direct contact. And mm -hmm. it's more of a, more blunt, I guess. Like, No yeah. Guys But My Own is very much far more, like, in your face about, like, occultism and stuff like that. And, like, my personal philosophies on magic and art and stuff like that. So it's way way yeah. way more blunt <laughs> and i love it yeah and you know we talk all the time about our toils and tussles within yeah. you know modern occultism and uh i've just uh i've really sung its praise uh to anyone that'll listen because i think mm -hmm. no gods but my own is just it's it hits the nail on the head i also yeah. wanted to read an excerpt um from your last uh 
output, old costumes and shifting shapes. And it just begins, and I thought this was a beautifully said. It says, I've always considered myself a skeptic for as long as I've orbited magic and occultism. There have been large aspects of the culture that I can't bring myself to align with or believe in. I'm not going to list all of those points of dissension here, but I do want to talk about the biggest one. I don't like gods, goddesses, demons, or spirits. And I mean, like, talk about blunt. That's blunt yeah. first trauma right there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Well, it's it's. I've always found it hard to really take the plunge and like give myself over to an entity, I guess you could say. Like it, none of it really rings true to me. Yeah. It all just kind of feels like it's a personal experience. It's like everybody sees what they're going to see. Right. And I don't know how so many differing things could be right at the same time and wrong at the same time. Like everything is existing in this like undulating blob of belief that right. we, we pick shapes out of. So it's hard for me to decide, yeah, this is true, this is false, this is true, this is false. And it's it's just all true. All yeah. of it. Well, I love it. And you you talk about it too later in the piece about uh, you know, militant agnosticism. Yeah. And it's funny too, because I've found myself in recent months uh really falling for the adage you are what you eat when it comes mm -hmm. to the content that you're imbibing. Oh, and definitely. um yeah, falling into a lot of the debunker communities and trying to be a kind of token of, hey, all woo isn't bullshit. There's some practical applications in certain ways, right? Trying to be that militant agnostic, but then yeah. finding out that people just love absolutism. Yeah, it's yeah. Sells tickets, you know. It definitely is. It definitely is. And especially in magic, there's like occultism and magic has so much fundamentalism, and they there's denial of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. like lots of people they're they're deep believers in their own like sex and like their own way of doing things and they don't understand that they are being fundamentalist like they're yeah and they they subscribe to the ethos and they go other ethos is are wrong and i will pick apart your ethos until you believe what mine is absolutely what what makes it any different than like you know a catholic <laughs> right well, and it's funny too, yeah, because we you know we both gripe about it a lot too, because it's not, it's just a club I'm not interested in over and over yeah. again, and uh, it, it you have to be kind of uh, part as the of these sects, as you say, you know, to kind of gain this wisdom that should be free for everyone, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, and these hierarchical need to you know, uh, I don't know, to generate some sort of power over others and. It's just, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all nasty, you know? Oh, yeah, way. yeah. It's it's why it's been it's been hard for me to be on Twitter. Yeah. I look, I look at people like they float an idea and then there's like 20 people that are more than ready to tear it down if they disagree with it. Yeah. And uh, a cult Twitter is not something I subscribe to. There, of course, there's a couple of people that, you know, yeah. rabble oh, yeah. rouse within it that I really love. But yeah, it, this whole, I don't know, this whole weird genealogy of you know thelemic beliefs within tiktok you know <laughs> or like yeah you know just these crazy it's like it's like these micro uh situations or hierarchies i mean to say yeah yeah, yeah. and like i like a big part of no gods but my own has been me trying to reclaim an individual individual practice yeah like how i got started in the first place yeah and that's been the most beneficial part of it. And it's kind of even built a higher level of like, like the whole idea of believing that everything is true. Like going that every God is true. Mm -hmm. That came because I'm like facing up to the fact that like over all these, all, all this time I was, I was a militant atheist when I was a teenager, believed in a bunch of stuff later. And then it's just like, I can't tell other people what's wrong. I can't tell yeah. other people what's right. Like, I know it's right inside of here <laughs> and here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for That's you. That's all. Right? That's all yeah. I got. What's it, um, you know, You we've talked a lot, too, about mundane magic. And it's mm -hmm. this, you've done a lot of Oracle works kind of imbibing 
you know, wondrous folkloric kind of metaphysics, self metaphysics about, you know, the mundane. And I've always yeah. loved that because that's your kind of, that's your animism of magic itself. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And how's I, that? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I actually have uh, one of the upcoming articles for no gods is a uh, mundane magic primer <laughs> where it's like a 5,000 word uh, essay on like my, I, my views of uh, like my, my tenets, makeshift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My makeshift animism. Yeah. But I was thinking about that earlier when I was, going over mundane magic in my head it is this agnostic animism of everything it's like you, you yeah. can't you can't pick the hierarchical necessity of communing with the other um for just some things you know and yeah somebody like me that uses tools like a tape recorder religiously right yeah like to me that is it's a it, it's sure it's talismanic but it's also you know, it's it's got a spirit within it of itself that I'm communing with all the time. Yeah, and it's, you know, aiding me. And, you know, I don't want to use the word manifest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we should just X that word out of. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, mean I'm but the, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I'm the same way with my sketchbook and my pens. It's like mm -hmm. I'm I'm using that as a tool. I don't I usually don't have an idea when I sit down to draw or write, I just do it and let, let the tool tell me where it wants to go. So how much of it is in, you know, for kind of a layman term, but how much of it is kind of this channeling kind of aspect? I mean, I honestly can't say because yeah. I'm like the, the more I try to pin down where my inspirations and where my ideas and all of that stuff comes from, the less I can get a handle on it. It's like, it's, it's a grease yeah. pig, honestly. It's just a grease pig. The moment I think I got a handle on it, it gets away. Yeah, the more you know, the less you do, for sure. Yeah. And that's kind of this, it's it's a really transcendent thought, I think. And I mean transcendent in the way that I think after people kind of invest themselves within these hier hierarchical structures, within occultism, break away, and then, you know, really commune with their selves by creating or customizing a you know their own doctrines and tenets to me that seems kind of the end all be all right yeah. i mean it, it seems like if you were to put it ironically enough in a hierarchical kind of transcendence <laughs> it seems mm -hmm. like <laughs> letting go of that and then creating their own seems to be you know what the goal should be yeah yeah definitely it's it's you know it's like bruce lee <laughs> yep be like water make your own stuff you know Jeet Kune Do it. Yeah, I love the Jeet Kune Do <laughs> stuff. Yeah. There was another, you said something in here too. I'm going to have to find it. Um, uh, yeah, when I say that I believe everyone is right, I'm being very, very literal. All gods, goddesses, spirits, and demons exist to those that want them to. I believe that all of these beings have the same origin point in liminal space and that our desires and biases have a very real influence on the population there. Just like an artist drawing up images from the ether, the true believer summons their divine benefactors. Shazam. Yeah. You know, and I, yeah. I start to, we're both comic nerds, obviously. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have Alan Moore talking about magic and the, you know, sequence. Oh, yeah. But he, he always touched on this. Is oh, that, yeah. you know, the imagination spectrum or plane mm -hmm. where everything exists. That's kind of yeah. what you're pulling from. Yeah. Was that a huge, that was a big influence, oh, right? definitely a big influence. Definitely yeah. a big influence. Like, it was either last year or the year before. It was the first time I read Promethea. Oh, yeah. Like, I, it, it was a series I had always just kind of forgotten about and ignored. And then the last couple of years, I've read it and reread it about three times. And <laughs> it's like, okay, okay, I get this. <laughs> you like, know what? Yeah. It's funny you bring that up because I feel like I myself within my own practice, I'm going back to basics in a way mm -hmm. where knowing, you know, like experiencing all of the different the like tundras of magical resonance throughout yeah. the years. Like and now I can, you know, pick up even Crowley or something and, and read it in a, with a different light than I had before. Yeah. And it's like I'm relearning. But at the same time, I'm not looking for something 
Does that if yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm definitely feeling the same way. Like uh the last time I reread The Invisibles. Yes, I was gonna bring that up. Man. Was a crazy experience when when you think about the ending and how basically like King Ma becomes the enemy. Like he comes yeah. so around the bend that he is he's the enemy in the end. In a way. Like he's become the businessman who runs an empire, mm -hmm. who has this thing that is supposedly going to bring everybody around. And Jack Frost has hit an enlightenment point that he wants for absolutely nothing. He lives on the street with his childhood best friend. Yeah, he won. <laughs> yeah. Like he he went full circle. He he saw everything, did everything, and went. Fuck it, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, that's a, and went home. That's funny. Yeah, it's I don't know. I keep uh, finding this rotating, you know, uh, servo about a lot of the folklore that I like, mm -hmm. and it's always the fuck ups that kind of come out in the end and are a bit more, you know, meditative than the righteous. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's even it's a trickster mythos. It's you know, it's uh, it's all that even just the uh, Anasazi and Zuni kind of creation myths yeah. about, you know, the coyote accidentally creating the world. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like, like exactly <laughs> trying to be selfish <laughs> about it, but then accidentally creating, you know, love and kindness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. But that's funny, yeah. And you know, you're no gods but my own. Uh, it's on Substack, which I should really look into doing because I love just that it's it's just word based. Oh yeah, and it's right? it's free. So. Yeah, and, but it's subscription based, and I love that you get to do. You have like a community kind of thing within it. Uh, not really. I've had a few people comment and a few people like send me emails and stuff because you can reply to the email. You're right. Like, oh, okay. All you have to do is hit reply, and if you reply to the email, I get that email. That you yeah. Write. Like how's it comes the, right to me. How's that community been building? Uh, I mean, I got, I got about forty subscribers right now, yeah. and it's I've had two or three people, like write to me. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'd like to get more communication, but it's yeah, that's kind of the uh, the bugaboo of all like all creativity it's like yeah if you're, you're trying to have a conversation usually it ends up being one-ended you know yes yeah or yeah i'm still fighting these non the nonchalance of uh, keeping up with the, like the yeah. communication stuff you know we used to talk yeah. so much and i feel like we we talk just maybe a couple times a week now it's because i've just had to kind of drop out a bit and yeah leave the phone home yeah, and I I hear you. Like I'm, like upcoming once like once I hit issue twelve of No Gods But My Own, I'm kind of I'm not shutting it down. I'm just setting it aside. Yeah. And, so you'll have another article series or just whatever. Oh uh, no, no, I'm gonna just basically go quiet. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, like I'm basically gonna drop out of Twitter, drop off of Instagram, yeah. and drop that for. The foreseeable future it's kind of uh i feel like i'm in an echo chamber right now and right it might be time for a break you know and i know we've talked about this in the past too about maybe doing a discord and kind of just yeah. having that background I, I i'm coming around to it more and more because when there's not consistent content output or whatever it's mm. nice to keep those conversations going yeah you know i just fear that i won't be as i i'm just so uh fickle <laughs> like, yeah yeah so fickle when it comes to that stuff you know well i get overwhelmed really easily these days yeah. i don't know what's going on with that but like my old anxieties have been ramped up to 10 now where it's like yeah. like releasing the omnibus Usually I get I get a little stressed out when I release something and like I follow the numbers and if the sales don't do well, like it hits me. But like this one really hit me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like sales were a bit lower than I wanted, than I expected. And it just like it was like this like like about a week ago, it just like felt like this like heart wrenching, like 
People and you know what like, sucks? People don't like me. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's totally not that. And I felt that way yeah. about, uh, you know, the audio sigil too. But at the same time, yeah. I have to remember that I'm not really, I'm so burnt out from the process that I'm not really yeah. doing much to yeah. promote it or, or post it places. Also, I get very, I don't want to be a salesman. That's like not yeah. why I signed up to do this. But I, I understand that it's part of it, you know, and I hope yeah. that people you know buy this omnibus because it's fucking gorgeous and it's uh, yeah. it's just a great I'll put, I'll say ellipses uh to be continued <laughs> on the outlet press stuff because I'm telling you like and your design stuff your I mean your just stuff your design <laughs> your design work <laughs> is just it's just top notch it really is yeah well I I know there was one book that actually when I finished putting it in here it made me wish I had released it at this size originally. Yeah. Because I got to play around with it and do like crazy, uh, like it really, it stands out more. Oh, yeah. And I started doing crazy designs with the art, like just embodying anxiety. <laughs> I love, yeah, because I, yeah, you have the different, even the, just the cadence of the size that is, a, you know, a visual cue. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Yeah, I got to do that with this, whereas originally, yeah, I couldn't do a layout like this. Instead, it, it was just single pages where it's right. like it's one after another after another. And it it's way more impactful having like the 10 pages spread on two in an array. That's so cool, you know. And to bring it back, uh, I'm I'm feeling that way about, uh, you know, specifically music, where mm -hmm. I'm thinking because I just did this live set with some old songs that I kind of reimagined, and it was like yeah. no one no one knows those old songs. <laughs> like no <laughs> one cares. What I would love to do is reimagine them and put it out. Who gives a yeah. fuck? It's mine. Like I can yeah. keep tugging at it why does it have to be over you know yeah and it and it honestly doesn't like i have i have novellas that i've done that with right where i've i've re-released one of them three times and i'm planning on collecting up the no gods but my own into a paperback when it's all done yeah and i'm going to include the two novellas that i've been toying with for the last 10 years is one of them king with toast? it hmm? is one of them king toast no, no. Okay, that no, was that just one. Cool yeah, yeah, that one gets to gets to die in obscure death. <laughs> I like it though; it's great. It, it brings the me. Nastiest, it's the nastiest thing I've ever written. <laughs> That's, oh, it's uh, it encapsulated that time so well. Oh, yeah. It was it was a great exorcism. <laughs> yeah. <it's... laughs> yeah, I I was reading it uh, a couple weeks ago. I was just cracking up, like laughing. I was yeah. like, damn here. <laughs> my um, my my wife and mother both had to set it down after reading about 30 pages. <laughs> I love that though, and that freedom to yeah, as you said, you know, to exorcise. Yeah. That, you know. Yeah. I mean that but was you, that was just pure vitriol. <laughs> yeah. You've always been a paragon though of like self-publishing too. And yeah. I just I love that. You gotta just, you know. I keep going back and forth about stuff, but, um, you know, I, I always look to you as somebody like, you know, if I'm going to publish something or if we, the hollow is going to do something like Eric's the guy, yeah. you know, cause I think, you know, with all your stuff with Amazon that you were doing forever and all the frustrations of their, you know, publishing, uh, application, mm -hmm. whatever that you had to use. Yeah. And yeah. then you just breaking into Lulu and taking that shit down and, Oh straight. yeah. Yeah. Well, and before I tried Lulu a long time ago and mm -hmm. I did not like their quality. <laughs> so that's why I stuck with Amazon for like 10 years. And now it's just like it, when I got the, got this, it blew my mind. I was like, this does not look like the Lulu stuff I ordered 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Cause uh, I've seen a lot of Lulu books. I mean, I'm always a fan of hard covers. How can you not be? Yeah. Uh, does Amazon like I mean I've gotten stuff from other creators through you know Amazon publishing you know people like Mitch Horowitz even 
yeah who will use it and it really does it's just it doesn't give it the weight that yeah. you'd hope but you know that's amazon for you yeah right? and that's i mean that's really the kind of the issue with amazon is like you have to you 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 disappear into it and also at the same time you have to be okay with dealing with amazon yeah and knowing what kind of company amazon is yeah I'm definitely not in the best place to have feelings about Amazon right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. Being in Seattle, but uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you could order something on Amazon; it arrives same day. It's very creepy here. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, super creepy. Yeah, um, but yeah. So, uh, what's funny too is uh, I was uh, started this thing. Michelle Embry, who's in the chat, she's got this uh, writing workshop that mm -hmm. she was gracious enough to let me join and. It's very uh, liminal uh, based. Yeah. And we were, you know, she had some great notes about different things. And a lot of it, you know, I share. And it's really just about the process, this liminal space that you're, you know, in when you're creating and yeah. communing, right, with, with yourself about that. What's your process like when you do this? Are you just sitting down and just going through it? Or do you have a certain ritual that you're? Oh, it's, it's kind of. It's different for everything. It's right. different for everything. And like different things hit me in different ways. Like these uh, these essays I've been writing lately, I've honestly been just piecing them together in the notepad on my phone. <laughs> like over like a week dot week, I'm just like putting a couple sentences here, paragraph here, whenever I, I do get that time. Yeah. And then I just kind of like smoosh it together and try and edit it into something that works. Are you handwriting uh, other times? Like, is that a big process? Because you're, yeah, your font, like you have a script, you know, of your your handwriting. It looks, it's very you, and very. Uh, no, yeah. no, I found that stuff. I found that oh. stuff. Oh, okay. I thought, <laughs> but you were, I uh, saw you were doing uh, with your new project, the Fauna one. Oh, 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 and, oh, yeah. yes, yes. That one is so, just handwritten in a notebook. That's handwritten and, in a notebook. Are you going to like showcase it that way? I'm not going to showcase gonna... it at all. Oh, cool. Yeah. Keep yeah, it for when yourself. It, yeah. It's, it's, uh, when I'm done, I'm going to collect it up. But as it's going, as it's a process, it's going to be all mine this time. I love that. Yeah. Take something for yourself, kid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't mind talking about what it's going to be. I just don't yeah, want to share like, what the pieces are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Surmise it for us. All right. Uh, it's called Fauna Namakon. And it's going to be a collection of 100 randomly selected animals as animal allies. Where you pick out of the book and it's like taking an animal and finding what its beneficial properties are and maybe applying it to yourself and your problems. And the first two animals, one was a, one of those goats that climbs on super steep hip mountains. Like mm -hmm. the, the sheer inclines, like 90 degree angle ones. Yeah. And then today's was flying squirrel. Nice. And it's like there, you can you could easily find things that like both of those animals do that you could kind of use to help yourself. Yeah, it's almost yeah. almost like a self help book in a weird way. I get it. I wonder too. Uh, has your son been receptive to a lot of your art and your your books and stuff? So he has one of my books, and it's one of his favorite books. And it's the weirdest choice of books that he likes. <laughs> it's The Mirror Ain't Broken, So It Must Be Your Face. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. And it's just this weird mutating face. And he absolutely <laughs> loves it. And he flips through <laughs> it and he looks at the faces. <laughs> Uh-oh. Psychiatrist. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's I love really, that one. That's, that's the only one he's really been exposed to. But I like when I do a drawing, I usually show my wife and then sometimes he's in the room and he's like, can I see? Can I see? And I show it to him. He's like, Daddy, you're great at drawing. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Like, oh, that's, that's I mean, I can, I, I need. my my <laughs> father, too, is a visual artist. And so yeah. I know that uh, uh, I have my troubles, but I, I, I know what it's like to kind of be raised with somebody that's deft with, you know, a kind of whimsical kind of drawing and mm -hmm. you know doing portraits and and stuff so i i just yeah i really resonated with that with 
you know, I wonder if your son's just picking your books out and looking at them or having fun with them. I think when yeah. he's a little older, he will. Yeah. I, I hope. I hope. There's definitely a couple I don't want him to read until he's older. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly yeah, King Toast. Sure. He can be a teenager when he sees that one. Yeah, for sure. Then I'll have to explain to him who Donald Trump was. And yep. Because he's just going to be like, who? <laughs> yeah, it's just a blip, you know. Yeah, wasn't wasn't Bush Senior just four years too? It's like, who's yeah, that? yeah, well, he's still by the wayside. <laughs> it's it's, and it's the weirdest thing to think about. Like, it's not like anybody talks about Millard Fillmore anymore, you know. <laughs> That's a deep cut. Yeah, yeah. nobody talks or about Jimmy that. Carter. Yeah, yeah. I talk about Jimmy Carter sometimes, but like, <laughs> yeah. I just all I know of him is he was a peanut farmer, and that's about yeah. where, where it is. Habitat for humanity. That's that's, that's all right. I know about him. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's funny when we talk about line or like a uh, uh, legacy. Yeah, and you know we were it, it ties in kind of well with that about you know kind of what you're leaving uh, artistically with the omnibus, and it's just this tome of like legacy. Yeah, and um you know is your are you are you kind of calling this omnibus you're going to keep it in print and that'll yeah. just be it for outlet press right yep yeah this i is think the, that's great this is the gravestone for outlet yeah. press yeah yeah it's this almost is... as big as one it is it is it is a heavy <laughs> book <laughs> oh it's so worth it though i encourage yeah. everyone to uh get a copy it's just it's really really gorgeous but yeah that must be um you know, when I was first thinking about it and asking you earlier, I was like, oh, there, there must be some sort of grieving process here. I'm so dramatic, you know. <laughs> and of course, of course, you're like, no, it feels good. It's yeah. yeah it's, get it's it out take, of here. It's taking off an ill-fitting suit. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's taking off shoes you didn't know were uncomfortable until they were off your feet. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your plan for this uh, supposed break after No Gods But My Own Ends? Uh, is it indefinite or... uh, it's, uh, whatever the uh, nothing's ever indefinite sure yeah <laughs> well i mean I, indefinite by open-ended you know it's oh like, it's very very yeah. open-ended very open-ended mm. i mean i could start up no gods but my own again a month after i say i'm done yeah i mean it's basically going to be whenever i come up with an essay or something it's just like the last few that i did talking about legacy and like trying to get everything down the last couple that I wrote, the like the very last article I wrote is <laughs> eighty five hundred words long. Yeah, because I <laughs> tried my best to go back in time and analyze how I got into magic and occultism and yeah. what brought me there. And it was <laughs> eleven rules of uh, what I call factory uh, factory gnosis. Yeah, where it's like 11 things that I learned working in factories that made me more magical than or made me think about magic more than most magical texts actually do. What's amazing is and this probably is absolutely bled into your mundane magic. But there is this time I think you touch on a lot about working in that factory was almost a gnosis for you because a lot of your art, a lot of your, you know, speaking of magical prisms and structures, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, mechanical in a way oh definitely yeah. definitely and like the only like i know people talk about having visions and stuff a lot and i've never really had any except for one very very vivid one when i used to work in the factory where i was just kind of imagining this massive like almost lovecraftian machine that's behind everything that doesn't give two shits about us <laughs> right yeah it's and like nature. Yeah. yeah and it's just this gigantic machine i mean i don't like the idea of like basically mechanizing everything because that kind of takes away the heartbeat of it but yeah i mean that's, that's definitely true. a prism of industrialism right there is looking at nature as if it's a machine instead of machine as if it's like nature well and couldn't we say too <laughs> that you're giving it a heart with you know works yeah. like mundane magic with like yeah. this kind of um uh inanimate animism right yeah, yeah yeah and like that's that's kind of what what i'm hoping for like i said 
in a weird way, I I'm planning as if I'm not going to be around in a year. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I don't think I'm going anywhere. No. Yeah. Uh oh. Oh. You okay? Whoa. Well, that went weird there for a second. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. You froze. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going. I see anywhere, what you mean. But... It's um, yeah, it's just kind of it's back to that comment about legacy, and I I feel that maybe it's just age, but yeah, I feel that too with every work. It's just kind of like okay, this is it. I'm retiring after this, or something's happening to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I turned forty back in July, yeah. and. I did not handle it as well as I had hoped. Yeah. <laughs> like I looked at it and like all the way leading up to it, I was like, Oh, it's just a number. It's just a number, just a number. And then the moment it hit, it was like, just like, like in 2001 where he's in that light tunnel where it's just like, yep. transcendence. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's like, <laughs> Holy shit. I'm 40 now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what was those kind of machinations with it? Was it just, uh like things lost things uh things never found you know yeah well, like, yeah i feel like i've kind of squandered a lot of time yeah <laughs> like, i feel that too yeah like i don't i i like the idea of being kind of like disattached like unattached from like the usual like the standard measure of success like I have a crappy job. Yeah. Like we rent instead of own. It's like all these things that used to be like really solid measurements of what it was like to be an adult. And like, by the time you're 40, you should have a great job. You should have a great house. You should have two cars. You should have three kids, all of this shit. And it's all, it's all bullshit. Yeah. But that draw well, you know is still there. <laughs> like yeah. Pressure is still 30. there. I get you. I feel that way too. And it's a, definitely a lot of careerism. Yeah. Uh, about it. Um, yeah. Like I work at a, I, on the weekends, I work at a car dealership with 20 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, it is weird because they treat me like second dad. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, they are all young enough to be my sons. Every, yeah. Every single one of them. Well, I have a, I have a weird, it's, you know, an, an kind of an ulterior want too, uh, which is family starting. And I feel that yeah. kind of that timeline ticking down and that's a weird, oh, yeah. you know, uh, scare or want, you know? Yeah. Well, so, and I started that super late. Yeah. Like super duper late. My son just turned four in May and mm -hmm. I turned 40 like yeah so yeah i was i was 36 when my son was born is that super late though i mean it, yeah i guess I so mean, yeah it i mean it used to my, be considered my, super late yeah I don't my know parents if were 19 anymore. you know my yeah. parents were 19 so and they often my, muse too uh my dad's life well, like my life is like what my dad's life if he didn't have me at 19 yeah <laughs> you know so oh like yeah very yeah definitely. creative sporadic but like at the same time like on like there's something that uh, family gives you with like frequency and yeah you know, focus oh definitely and, yeah yeah and like my parents were 30 when they had me like they yeah. lived a very full life before i was born and they they lived it for another decade after i was born <laughs> before they kind of settled into the whole parenting thing yeah and but i i look at my brother and he had his first kid when he was 19 mm -hmm. and he got to watch me be you know wishy-washy yeah, yeah be a 20 year old yeah like i got to be you know when i was 27 i got to be a 27 year old mm -hmm. i didn't have a i didn't have two or three kids that were depending on me i had me depending on me that's very true. I never really looked at it that way that like, yeah, I was kind of my perfect self at every age because I had no dependence. And that's yeah. a scary thought. Like, yeah. yeah, I can't believe I survived, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's a it's, it's definitely it's a uh, it's a different kind of like anchors a bad word for it. Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind of like tether to reality when you have 
a little a little person depending yeah. on you to keep your head a on straight. Machine. So yeah, like a they, little they, machine they, with the heart. Yeah. Yeah, they need to be fed. They need to go to bed. Yeah. They need to they need to poop, you know. So with how it relates though to, you know, this kind of mechanical animism that you see mm -hmm. Uh, the world. I, I was wondering this the other day that when you look at creators who are, you know, so perfectly themselves in a weird way, like I would say you are a perfect machine for Eric J. Millar. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, that that's you totally. You look at somebody oh, yeah. like Nick Cave, like, of course, his name is Nick Cave. And of yeah. course, he looks like this. And of course, you know what I mean? Like, he's kind yeah. of this perfect machine of what he creates tom waits you know mm -hmm. you look at these people and i think my my thing and my harrowing idea for for myself was like i don't know if i ever figured out my machine i don't know you know what i mean i don't ever yeah. I, I don't know yet um and yeah it's just an interesting thing because i think that's uh you know there's this ability to kind of attune to it to commune with it and then become it and, you know, uh, you know me, especially w after all of our talks and how, yeah. you know, things go haywire in the world of, you know, interpersonal stuff or personal stuff. Like, yeah. it's hard to latch on to that machine and to commune with it. Right. It's too oh, yeah. divergent at times. Oh, yeah. Way. Yeah. Yeah. And like that, that's actually kind of part of why I'm separating for a little while. Is yeah. The the behind the scenes is a little bit more hectic right now than it used to be. Yeah. You know? it terrible fours. Yeah, basically, yeah. basically <laughs> like discovering a, uh, a thing that kids have that you never knew existed before called stool withholding. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 I, th I had cool. that. I think. Yeah. Who yeah. knew that a kid, if they don't want to shit, they'll wait 10 days. <laughs> yeah. I was embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> yeah when i was a kid that was a lot of it because like i don't want you yeah. in the bathroom like i'm fine i'm fine you know yeah i do remember that but i would also wet the bed all the time too because yeah. i would just withhold yeah know. yeah that's part of it that's all yeah. part of it and it's it's incredibly difficult and like there's like physical parts of it psychological parts of it there's all yeah. sorts of stuff and it's like and at the same time i'm doing preschool for my son like i'm i'm so my son's teaching. preschool yeah <laughs> Because my mom did early childhood education for 25 years and she's helping me design a lesson plan and I'm teaching my son his ABCs, one, two, threes, and how to read. That's very cool though. Oh yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, and, super stressful, I imagine. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I, I feel for teachers. Teachers are hard the yeah. hardest working people in in public service. Yep. And right when I, I just got a new teaching job. And, ah! <laughs> yeah, teaching art after school. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, amongst the outdoor education stuff. But yeah, you're not wrong. It is. Uh, I think Louis C.K. had a joke about it. It's like yeah. the uh, it was something like, hey, do you want to, um, you know, do you want to make kids like math? Sure. Are they into it? No. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay who am i teaching anyone who's close to the building yeah exactly the... <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know exactly. So there was, it was something like that i butchered it but yeah it's, and uh we're it's just so funny like all these teachers are all just like creative degenerates <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> you know that's who's teaching your youth they're a bunch of creative degenerates you know yeah. um but that's cool. I like the homeschooling aspect a lot, yeah. especially since you were already kind of, you know, with him, mm -hmm. you know, during the week and stuff. So I imagine oh, yeah. it was an easier transition than most. You would think that, but not quite. No. <laughs> uh, kids are really good at saying no to parents and not very good at saying no to teachers. Oh, yeah. So if you try to teach your kid, well, you're also the parent that they always say no to. It's really, really hard to get them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, thanks. I'm good. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's like, I got to be, I'm teacher dad right now, not just dad. I'm teacher yeah. dad right now. Just put on a mustache. Yeah. I'm going to have to yeah, do something like that. So, yeah. Just the visual cue, you know? Yeah. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Well, man, um, I really appreciated you coming and chatting. Um, yeah. How you doing on time? I'm sure you got to get back. So I got, I got easily another 10, 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I'd love to talk more about. Um, so one thing I never got to do with everyone separately about the audio sigil was talk oh, about yeah. their uh, contributions. Oh yeah. So I'd love to talk to you about all the sure. cool shit that you did <laughs> on the audio sigil. Um, yeah, please. What was uh, give us the background of the uh, the, like Mandelbrot kind of? Oh man, those are basically repurposed artifacts of when I fancied myself a musician like 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I I just messed with them, and like I had a program that I had found 15 years ago called Musanum Mm. that used the Mandelbrot set to create music. And I would just fiddle with the numbers as the, this like generative music creator went. And then over the years, I've tweaked it and played with it over and over and over again until it turned into what's on there. That's yeah. So that that's what we were talking about earlier about kind of recycling old, yep. old stuff. And you tweaked it recently, right? To yeah, yeah, really pretty recently. Okay. I yeah. think it was like right before you started the, uh, right before you started the 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 audio sigil i had retweaked it and made it all like i had it on Bandcamp and all of that right yeah I, uh, i've since taken it off again because it was just too depressing to look at the stats on it oh yeah i don't know it's like <laughs> i know i should be like consoling you uh about that stuff but i got nothing yeah <laughs> like yeah stats was, are a bitch like, yeah i, I looked at the stats yeah. and i was like it's not even worth it. Like, I think I had zero plays for six months and I'm like, okay, I think I'm good. I think people are good on this. I think yeah. it can go away. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm really trying to dig deep and find something because I would be talking to myself too and yeah. consoling that aspect. Like, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's easy to disappear. Like it's, it is, it's truly easy for creative stuff to disappear. Yeah, it is. You know, uh, one of the big sadnesses, too, was I used to use MySpace back in the day for a lot Mm -hmm. of demos and music stuff. It was, you know, great. I could post stuff and change stuff. And whenever that, I believe it was a Justin Timberlake acquisition or something, they screwed up Mm -hmm. all the servers. So I just lost, Mm -hmm. like, time. But it was my bad for, you know, I'm too much of a Dharma bum. I don't ever keep anything. So Yeah, no backups. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's this cloud idea is nice. Um, yeah, if it's there and I can connect to it, but like if yeah. I don't have backups, say la vie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't trust the cloud. I got like three hard yeah. drives that have everything on them as well as the cloud. Yeah, yeah. I need to start doing that. But one comment I will say is I can't wait till I uh, stop thinking that I'm a musician. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's got to be talk about relieving of just like, yeah. Dude, just i mean i think i feel that way anyways um i was talking to lux estrada and she kept calling me one and i was like this feels weird i, I, I don't i don't think of myself as a musician <laughs> you know it's, uh, it's i have the same problem with artists it's like yeah it's yeah. an ill-fitting title it's a really really truly ill-fitting title i like i like writer because it's true but it's yeah. also it's very blue collar sound. It's like very trade sounding. And yeah. that's kind of the type of writer I was, you know, as a journalist and stuff. Yeah. So it's like I get that, you know, yeah. but musician. No, I'm not. I'm not a good musician. I, yeah. I'm, you know, maybe write songs and, you know, release a lot of music. But I don't I'm not jamming with Steve Vai on any. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> I'm not a hired gun by any chance, you know, Yeah, by any means. Um, but yeah, the Mandelbrot, uh, what I loved about that too is uh, there was k- something kismet about it because I did a video for a demo during lockdown uh, when we were, uh, like right before I announced, you know, the us announced that we wanted to do the audio sigil and I used a Mandelbrot uh, imaging software mm-hmm. for the video. And it took like yeah. hours to render two <laughs> seconds of scene. Yeah. And I just always thought, yeah, it was cool that we were both on that that Mandelbrot kick. Yeah. For a little bit for the idea. But 
you know, what I when I gave the when I drafted up the um uh, the call to arms or whatever for the audio sigil, what came pouring in was just like incredible. And I didn't say no to any any piece, every piece that was suggested. Yeah. Uh, you know, made it in there, but yours mostly was kind of the ghost of the entire piece, you know. Yeah. And I use that as a use a lot of your tracks as backdrops, as like kind of a sinew within the sinew. Of, yeah, you know, it's, it's a good bad music. music. It's a good it's bad what? music. It's a good bad music. Good bad what music. A, bed, like oh, it's a, bad it's a music. Good, it's yeah. a good bed. You can you can put yes. a lot of stuff in it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely got a substrate quality to yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was always, that was super fun to mess with. And yeah. that informed, your Mandelbrot stuff informed a lot of my Audiomantic stuff within the audio sigil too. I yeah. would put it on, I would meditate with a guitar and, you know, an amp and kind of the dark, you know, we, well, we were living in a tiny apartment at the same, at the time. So I didn't have a, didn't have the, audio mancy chamber as yeah. i once did or do now but you know i would just kind of get into a sort of you know trance as i do with these rituals and mm -hmm. strum you know discordant kind of chords and you know just absolutely made up finger fingering uh, frets that's mm -hmm. a don't quote me on that fingering frets <laughs> um but you know and would kind of just envelop myself in these soundscapes and that's how a lot of the uh you know the the sub album within it was created was you know uh kind of meditating on your mandelbrot pieces so that was a really fun collaboration yeah in a in a, in a metaphysical kind of sense oh yeah and i was i was yeah. always super impressed how you uh, integrated that stuff in there like, yeah it was it just it fed so well together and then yeah it was crazy yeah yeah and then all that stuff fed into the visuals i made <laughs> like the visuals wouldn't have been wouldn't have existed without what you had created mm -hmm. and what everybody else had created yeah it was a creative collaboration or a burrows for sure um, oh yeah i love my big thing and i keep telling this to people you know to you can get the uh the album track by track right on Bandcamp, but i always tell people yeah. like take off the the pausing in between songs if you can yeah but most importantly do do the Bandcamp thing so you get a high quality pdf of your design stuff with it because i think that was to me that was one i sh you know we we can still do this and figure out ways to uh kind of promote it because i think it kind of got lost in the shuffle of all the music stuff but your design work for the sigil is amazing you know? yeah and i did it fast <laughs> like, yeah like i think in in grand total i think i spent maybe two hours on it <laughs> yeah just that's funny. Of like pulling pulling different elements out of different places and just like sticking them together yeah because you were we talked about it in a way and like how i saw it you know mm -hmm. Uh, was very much a, you know, uh, nature kind of substrate, kind of fallen substrate. Mm -hmm. um, and you had thought about, well, what if, because you were doing these drawings of, you would take like, uh, you would take text or books that were already kind of existing and doing mm -hmm. like the Crispin Glover kind of rat catching kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But drawing on top of it. And I was just like, those are beautiful. Maybe we can... Mm -hmm figure out how to you know integrate that and how you did it was yeah perfect i mean it's just that was that's to me that's that's what the record sounds like is your art you know yeah and i think what would surprise people the most is how analog those things really were yeah all hand drawn and yeah like crazy, the, the right? black and white artwork is hand drawn mixed with like actual physical clip art that i have from like a 70 year old clip art book so it's right. all it's cut ups. Yeah. It's cut ups. It's literal yeah. cut ups. Like if you saw the originals, they don't have the photos in the background, but they have the actual like drawn elements in the front. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, you should. Do you have like a, a way to kind of print those? 
uh i would love to figure out a way to i know for me just to have a couple of prints to hang up well, i mean <laughs> i know they have the, like uh like red bubble and stuff like that and they do okay. prints on there yeah yeah that would be so cool to have the cover it was really hard deciding the cover because every every piece was just so enigmatic of the entire piece yeah. you know but yeah the butterfly uh, yeah that, that cover thing. like that felt like the cover that one totally I, felt yeah. like the cover the moment i finished it i was like that's the cover that has to and be I you know for some promotional stuff we had text on it but i was like no like if, if people are downloading this or getting it it just needs to be that image no text yeah. like it says yeah. it says everything yeah yeah there's these and i love the three fingers or you know mm -hmm. like these and that's that's such an eric millar <laughs> like print these yeah. kind of humanoid you know yeah creatures. and the finger thing i don't even know what i'm doing with the finger thing like i think <laughs> Not like, I have a, press, are you? <laughs> like I think I, I a lot of my drawings have people holding up random fingers and in random hand gestures. And I think I got it from Doctor Strange. Oh one yeah. The, Doctor Strange comics where it looks like he's having like the yeah. like, hand sim it's kind of like the yeah. The Ditko and, Strange stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's just like different fingers in different places and like yeah. it never means anything. <laughs> <laughs> i know i thought they translated that pretty well though in the recent oh, movie yeah. it's a funny yeah. what do you call them what's the um indian hand gesture is it or mudra Hindu? mudras yeah 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 but yeah, yeah they did pretty good with that um but yeah i was uh you know uh to bring it around like that was my postpartum depression when mm. when that uh when that ended i kind of yeah. had this staring at the you know see kind of moment about mm -hmm. oh okay what's next you yeah know? and my my issue and it's still not over with you know i can we can still promote it um but it's so hard when you finish something that's so enigmatic and so part of your process and so part of your mental health process too that yeah when it's out there it's hard to sell it then yeah and i think that's what my it wasn't about selling on too that's yeah. a crude word for but you know just promotion or yeah. getting the word out yeah and i it, i definitely feel a need and a service to all of you that collaborated with me on this to you know keep sharing it and keep uh doing stuff with it so i'm thinking that i'll kind of go through and do I'm, I'm just i'm at the stage right now where i'm just uh, marketing strategies whizzing by me like trigonometry you know my, <laughs> my brain and i can't understand any of it but one yeah. of the ideas is to kind of pump it's to pump that up a bit and maybe share individual tracks with um you know with your art on instagram just small things yeah. like that yeah or do like um, spotlights I have I downloaded some old, uh, you know, early 1900s films that I'm going to cut up to it. And so it has a YouTube presence, that's you know, cool. with some fun things yeah. with titles. Um, but yeah, that's like coming out again. Like there should be it's funny. There's this need for people when they finish something that, oh, shit, you got to get it out. Like you have to you have to keep yeah. pushing it. And I'm like, no, give yeah. me a couple months and then yeah then i can start the process you know <laughs> yeah and i i definitely feel that like i i hate promotion yeah <laughs> like it's the it's the worst it's like it's like pulling teeth to me yep like most of my lack of sales is due to the fact that i hate promoting so much <laughs> <laughs> it's so true i hate it hate it absolutely little well, it's it, but it's one of those things it's it, people expect artists to wear so many hats now like mm -hmm. in the in the realm of social media, an artist or a creator has to wear so many hats. Whereas, how do you find time to actually create when you're spending all this time creating an image? You're creating yeah. an image and selling an image. When do you create the actual work? Like, yeah, when does that start? Yeah, when does it end? Yeah, yeah. when does it start? If you have to have a job, if you have to like watch your kid, if you have to do all this other stuff. It really it takes it, it takes away like the 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 equity of it like it's, yeah. it makes it so people with money people that have the time that just are like 
they can float along. They have more time to promote. They have more time to do all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, they can still create. Other people, yeah. I have just enough energy to create. <laughs> yep. Yeah, amongst the other things. You know, Mary was funny because she she's she listens to other podcasts and she mm -hmm. hears my gripes and she, you know she's always like you should just get somebody to do all the back end stuff i was like yeah that would cost money and also i'm kind of a control freak <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's you know? why i self-publish it's why i self-publish yeah, like, <laughs> with the record we're we're helping i'm helping her with her record mm. and we you know she's always talking like wow so what's it what's an engineer versus a producer and i'm like um well in our case it's both <laughs> like there's not there's not there's no separation because we're just gonna have to be wearing all the hats here to do this yeah you know what i mean like yeah we it's so funny because she'll joke like wow you can just get somebody else to do all the annoying stuff for you like you know <laughs> and i was like yeah i guess so yeah that's, uh that's the thing people outsource you know all yeah. the time yeah well like when I when I when the impossible game got picked up by a microcosm, it was the weirdest thing. Like I it was just like just, talk, yeah. just send just send us the text and send us the pictures. We'll do the rest. I'm like, you guys don't want me to lay it out or design it up for you, like do any of the other stuff. It's like, nah. I honestly haven't seen it. Like I don't even know what it looks like. It came out like seven months ago. I had I don't know what it looks like. I need to pick <laughs> up a copy. Um yeah. I, I don't even have a copy. I don't even know what it, it looks like. It's just a pamphlet, right? Or like yeah, yeah. They made it into like a thirty-six page pamphlet. Okay. Yeah, interesting. I wonder what that. Yeah, I'm know, super I, curious. I I you know have, uh, you know, I've followed Microcosm forever, and I have a mm. friend who, who claims, that because I told, uh, them about you, that's how they found out, and I was like, I don't think that's how it works. Um, <laughs> but this person is, uh, like to take a lot of credit for a lot of things. Yeah. No, um, I emailed them. I yeah, emailed them and said, exactly. do you want, do you want any work of mine? And they said, Sh show it to us. Yeah. And they shot um, down, they shot down the disruption generator, which is super interesting <laughs> to me. I guess they wanted to start small, right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. See how went. Maybe see how the impossible game sells. You know, I still have yet to watch them, but Microcosm has been doing a lot of YouTube stuff. They get like yeah. no views, but it's always That's weird. Yeah, it's super weird, but it's always about, you know, about independent publishing and, you know, how to find a publisher, like very informational, cool yeah. YouTube videos. I just, yeah. yeah, I find like they're in that weird chasm of super small, but yeah. widely known. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. weird. It's they seem epic to me, but they're pretty they're pretty like down on the ground, nitty gritty. Yeah. Are you gonna so you you just did they put it out and then you you all I'm, kind of communications kind of stopped or yeah, I haven't had contact with them in six months. Uh -huh. So I'm supposed to get a statement and see how well it's done this month at some point. Oh, okay. But uh yeah, I I probably should have ordered a couple copies for myself <laughs> i'm gonna with, definitely do that yeah, yeah with i just want to see how they how they handled it with COVID, i got no shows i got no shows to go to and i got like the i used to do a thing called comics thing every yep. four months and the building that it used to be in is gone wait they tore down the eagles lodge it's gone what it is gone oh that's so sad Last time I went to Southeast Portland, it was just an empty lot. Oh, that's so sad. I love the Eagles Lodge. So did I. Oh. So did I. Yeah. And those shows were great. Like, if they would have made it, like, even, like, six more months, they probably could have started having shows again. Damn. That's, yeah, I know. Like, we're, we're seeing all the reverberations from just the kind of, yeah, you know, destruction this past year has yeah. created. It's it's so sad. All the, uh, the old haunts in Portland, especially... I was back there yeah. a couple months ago, just gone. Yeah, it's just a mess. Yeah. Like I I hard. I haven't been downtown in two years. Yeah. Myself. There's no so, reason. 
Yeah, no, no. Like I, I only had a few reasons to start with. Right. And those reasons have no longer exist. Yeah. Uh, well, pouring out for the, uh, for the businesses yeah. in Portland, for sure. You know, yeah. Seattle, I, I didn't really have a relationship with beforehand, so I don't really know. Yeah. But it seems to be trucking along fine, considering. Yeah. yeah. You know. I haven't heard anything bad about Seattle. I mean, you <laughs> hear than, bad yeah. stuff about, you used to hear bad Everywhere. stuff about Portland every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, also... I'd say maybe 30% of it was true. But <laughs> yeah, Portland's just such a it's just a such a hot pot of. Oh, yeah. Of things. And it's very it's it's a lot smaller, too. And it's it's still kind of in this process of finding its identity in a yeah. weird way. And so it's just yeah, it's it's just a very condensed and enigmatic kind of situation where i feel you know seattle's been a big city for so long and one of the major metropolitan areas of of the country that it just kind of does its own thing and yeah (laughs) it is what it is i've heard stories of portland 30 years ago oh yeah and it seems to me that we're just going back to what portland was before like yeah if you want to go all Stephen King on it, the city's just becoming what the city wanted to be. Right. <laughs> like, uh, it's just it... like, it's like, I just you know, shake those extra people off and do what yep. it's going to do. It's an, it's an, it's its own being. <laughs> There's a great book that I read over a decade ago. Uh, the first time I lived in Portland, it's called Portland Confidential. Mm-hmm. And its history is crooked as shit. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. But oh, yeah. Uh, it's good to see it you know push so hard against it in a way but there's still some underlying you know there's some tethers of darkness yeah there's some (laughs) there's some gross shit there and it's not the gross shit that they talk about in the media nope (laughs) they avoid that part i'm just yeah i'm ready for a sojourn into the to the wilderness oh me too you know me too me and mary watch a lot of these um you know, build your own kind of yurt, mm. uh, you know, uh, refurbish a bus kind mm. of thing. And, you know, I'm very much. Yeah. Just less yeah. is more. Less is well, more. Like, I grew up in Minnesota and like rural Minnesota, where the closest town was 18 miles away. Yeah. And like my parents have like 10 acres of trees. Just lots and lots of trees and shitty swamp land. And it's like. It's quiet. It's yeah. so quiet. It's quiet. Yeah. It's so quiet. And at night, it is pitch black. There's zero uh, light pollution. Like, when the stars are out, it's just just a blanket of stars. Yeah. And See galaxies. Yeah. Year after year, I kind of miss that more and more. Yeah. I remember you kind of discussing maybe that was a possibility of... It still is. Yeah. It still is. It definitely still is. I mean, it seems like it would just be, you know, you'd have family and oh, yeah, just be more equitable. Like, it would, and all, yeah, it's the job market and the rental market are the two main reasons not to because oh, nobody pays shit. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, man, uh, no gods but my own. Uh, I want everyone to check out the link in the description if you're watching now. I will, of course, edit this a little bit, give more of a tight intro and whatnot for wide release. Uh, That sounded very sexual. Um, (laughs) But uh, Eric, always a pleasure, man. Um, You know, uh, very dear friend of mine, and you've been just such a wonderful collaborator. And Thanks so much, man. Yeah, well, you're one of my favorite people, so ditto yeah. kiddo yeah always happy always, always happy to talk cool man yeah we got to do this like reoccurring i know we oh, yeah. keep toying with it i'm still yeah just still finding my legs my oh, seattle yeah. legs sea legs yeah, you'll get there you get yeah. there you're, you're you're nimble like a cat <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> i'm on i'm on life nine though tell you what <laughs> But uh, yeah, thanks again. And thanks everybody who's watching the Patreon stream and haunt on everybody. 